Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, welcome to this twin motion workshop as part of Dezine's Redesign the World competition with Epic Games. Uh, my name is Benedict Hobson. I'm Chief Content Officer at Dezine. Uh, and today I'll be joined by Belinda Erkan and Sam Anderson from Epic Games, who are going to talk us through twin motion and share some tips and tricks for how to use it. Um, twin motion, as I'm sure you know, is an architectural visualization tool um, which participants will need to use to enter Dezine's Redesign the World contest. Uh, we announced this competition on Dezine last week, uh, and it calls for new ideas to redesign the planet. Uh, entrants will need to use Twin Motion to present their concepts, which is why we're hosting this workshop today. I'll shortly bring Belinda and Sam onto the call, uh, but first I just need to go through a few details of how the session will work. Uh, Belinda and Sam will explain what Twin Motion is all about uh, and go through a roughly 30 minute demonstration of how to use it. Uh, then we'll have a Q&A session at the end where you can ask them any questions you might have. Okay, uh, I think it's time to bring our guests on. Uh, Belinda, Sam, please turn on your cameras and mics. How are you guys doing today? Feeling great. Good, good, nice good to, to be see here. you. So many yeah. people from around the globe. It's, it's great to see, yeah, it's great to see yeah. so many people here. Um, thank you guys for, for joining us. Um, before we get stuck in, maybe you could spend a, a short time just to quickly introduce yourselves to our audience. Um, Belinda, why don't you go first? Tell us who you are and, and what your role is at Epic. Sure. Um, so yeah, my name is Belinda and I'm the product marketing manager for Twin Motion Epic Games. And I'm uh, coordinating all sorts of marketing efforts around Twin Motion. Um, we're owning the positioning, branding, and, and messaging. And yeah, I'm just helping to communicate what the, the brand and the product stand for. Great, fab. Uh, and Sam, what's, what's your role at Epic? Hello everyone, I am Sam Anderson and I'm the tech marketing manager at Epic and I work in Unreal and Twin Motion creating technical content. So that's going to be any visual or educational resource for the architectural sector. Great. Um, fab. Um, so before we get stuck in, into the um, tutorial, uh, I think it'll be useful to explain a little bit uh, about what Twin Motion actually is, what it does. Um, so Belinda, for, for the benefit of people who are, might be brand new to Twin Motion, um, could you maybe briefly explain what the tool is and, and what it can do? Sure. So in essence, uh, in very simple terms, Twinmotion is a so-called real-time uh, architectural visualization tool. And it's initially developed by architects for architects who wanted to have a very quick and easy way to visualize their data, their BIM or CAT data, in a way that's both quick and visually appealing instantly, you know, without having to go into a myriad of, of rendering settings. So Twinmotion is precisely designed uh, as a simple visualization and prototyping tool for anyone who's not a uh, architectural visualization specialist. So with Twinmotion, any, any generalist can feel like a, a pro and, and tap into the world of, of real-time 3D and, and convey design ideas and concepts and, and create images and animations in a, in a real-time environment. So you can start populating your scene and creating all sorts of outputs and you get that instant visual high quality feedback right away. So you don't have to wait anymore for an image to render out and for hours and hours and hours just to get a certain level of photorealism. So with real-time 3D, you, um, you, can, you get that level of photorealism right away. So that's the nature of real time, which we borrow from, from game engine technology. Yeah, you, you mentioned the game, the game engine. I mean, um, Twinmotion is, is developed by Epic Games. Uh, people probably most familiar with that name for uh, uh, the name behind names like Fortnite, like video games. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could spend a little bit about how Twinmotion relates to, to Epic Games. Where does Twinmotion sit in, within yeah. Epic? Yeah, maybe I'll just dial back a little bit and, and talk a little bit about Epic Games and, and what it's actually famous for besides all the games. So it's, uh, as you said, it's a video game and, and software developer famous for Fortnite and Unreal Tournament and 
Gears of War and all sorts of game games. And those games have been created by game designers using a certain game engine um, tool, which is called Unreal Engine, which is in its core technology, a real-time 3D creation tool. And that's developed by Epic Games. And um, we make that un we make Unreal Engine uh, free. It's it's commercially available for anyone, for game designers, and for people outside the gaming industry. So the automotive industry, film industry, and the architecture industry. So now Twin Motion took the Unreal Engine and converted in or turn it into a very simple uh, real-time visualization tool utilizing the core technology of Unreal. It's basically a, a very simplified version of, of Unreal Engine. So, and, and they added a very simple UI on top of, of the core technology, simple features, simple workflows, but maintaining that real-time nature of Unreal Engine. So that's the technical context of Twin Motion. And, and we just want to make sure that anyone who wants to try out real-time 3D without, you know, having to go through a myriad of tutorials and, and who just want to have an easy entry point into real-time, that's where Twin Motion comes into play. And that's where we feel like um, this accommodates any, anyone's needs to very quickly visualize things and buildings and designs, design ideas in, in, in real time. And is that one of the kind of advantages to using essentially a game engine um, to, to use to create architectural visualizations? Yeah, that's, that's one of them. Real time is one of them. But I feel like, uh, so when we speak about uh, the benefits of game games and game technology, I feel like that not just architects, like anyone, engineers, designers, like creatives from creative industries can learn a lot from the game industry and, and borrow a lot of benefits from, uh, from games because, so with game engines, with game engine tools, you create games and games are nothing else but a, like a simulation of reality, right? It's a artificial construct of reality. And architecture, I feel like it's before you build your building, you want to first test it. You first want to simulate it. You want to feel like what's the relationship between my, my design idea and the end user. So before you build, you really want to first test it, not the other way around, build and then test. You want to first create that simulation of reality and then like use game components from games in order to communicate your design ideas. So game components, for example, uh, like entering buildings or opening a door, you, you click and press on things in games, right? And information pops up and you're interacting with the world and, and with an with a idea in a, in a very new way. And these game components can be very well utilized um, in the way architects can share their design ideas. So that's where it all comes together. And so the architectural design process feels more and more like a game actually and it, i think that's it's a beautiful thing and it's what people want and designers i mean they they want to stand inside their idea i guess and and you can do that very well in a simulated reality and that's enabled by uh game engines and, and game technology so do you, do you think this this software is having quite a big impact then on 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 industries like architecture yeah i feel like the entire technological thing that's happening around real-time 3D and, and also that we are simplifying that technology and making it accessible to anyone, that we're like democratizing it. That's causing an entire shift in the way we create and in the way we solve problems. I mean, in the end, the whole te the technology thing is just about solving problems in a smarter and better way. I mean, that's why we're here to solve the problem of planet Earth, right? subject to climate change and turning problems into opportunities. And that's where this real-time tech can, yeah, drive, drive a lot of things in a very beneficial way. Yeah, and you mentioned kind of democratizing, um, kind of 
increasing access to these kind of powerful tools. Um, how easy is Twin Motion to use? Um, like, can can anyone basically pick it up from scratch? So from what I know, and also from my own experience, when I shifted from older technology and offline renders to the world of real time, and I tried Twin Motion, it's it's very friendly. It's very intuitive. The UI doesn't scare you. It's not it's not a daunting experience. You know, you're not bombarded with any settings. It's a very intuitive way to learn the, the software. It's self-explanatory. It's uh, it has very um, coherent workflows and yeah, it is what you see is what you get right away. You're diving into twin motion and into real time. You start playing a game, you click and play, and you're in this creative design process right away. And it's a it's a very interesting experience. Great. Well, I think we're going to get a bit of a, a taste for that now. Um, thanks so much, Belinda, for giving that overview of, of Twinmotion and what it can do. Uh, Sam, I think it's over to you now um, to um, yeah, show people a bit, some kind of more hands-on tips and tricks for, for how to use Twinmotion. Yeah, absolutely. So as Ben mentioned, I'm going to be giving you a taste of the software. I see that we have some community members in the audience. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, however, not everyone is a part of our community just yet. So you first might need to download Twinmotion. In order to do this, there is a link on the competition brief that you can use, and it will direct you to the page to download the software. First, you'll need to set up the Epic Games launcher. And once you have that Epic Games account, you'll be able to use it for other resources, such as Quixel Megascans. If you've never heard that word, don't worry, I'm going to refer to it a little bit later. But yeah, this will be a base introduction to the software. It's going to help you bring in your models, such as SketchUp, into the Twinmotion software and create the image and animations for the competition. So let's go ahead and get this tutorial fired up so we can dive into Twinmotion. You'll see that I have the Epic Games Launcher pulled up here with the Twin Motion tab selected. Here, you'll be able to have the option to download the Twin Motion software. Once it's completed, you'll be able to hit launch to open up the program. I'll be using Twin Motion 2021.1.3, which is the latest update that we have. To give a little context to those numbers, that point three is referencing the latest hotfix for our 2021.1 release. Now the project's open, you'll see that I have a base scene here. So let's first take a look at the navigation. I'm going to go to the right hand side to the eyeball, go down to the navigation button at the end. I'm going to hit show navigation. Here I'll be able to look around pan orbit as described up above, but I could also select the settings cog and I could switch in between several different software. So if there's one that you're familiar with, it might be nice to switch over to that. If not, feel free to keep it at Twin Motion. I'm going to go ahead and hide this navigation panel, and I'm going to import a model and then take a look at some of the additional UI. So I'll import this here, and I'm going to bring in an FBX file that I have. And I'm going to take a look at the options here. So you'll see that there is a collapse by material as well as keep hierarchy. I'm going to collapse mine by material. This is going to optimize my project a little bit. I'll be able to quickly switch out materials. However, if your geometry has a lot of structure that you'd like to keep in place, you can select Keep Hierarchy. If you have any issues with your axis or unit conversion, you can always go and change it here. I'll go ahead and select OK. And since I collapsed my material, there might be some material conflicts that pop up. This is letting me know that I have multiple materials with the same name in my project. I'm going to use the scene material so that I don't have duplicates. So I'm going to hit OK. I am bringing in an FBX model, but you can bring in any data from virtually all 3D content creation programs. We support importing FBX, SKP, C4D, and OBJ files. We also are compatible with a lot of different software such as ArchiCAD, Revit, SketchUp Pro, Rhino, which includes Grasshopper, and RootCAD as well. So I'm just taking a look here at the model that I have. And to better understand the elements and objects that we have here, I can pull up the scenes graph. So the scene graph is going to be on the right hand side. And you'll notice that the model I brought in is here. If I hit this drop down button, I'm going to have all of the geometry that I brought in. And it's going to show all of the elements I bring in as well. 
So that is going to be elements from the library. So on the left hand side here, I have this library that has objects. This is going to be any entourage or furniture, any lights that I bring in or characters. But for now, let's take a look at the materials. So what I can do is I can go down to the middle of the screen and hit this eyedropper button. And I'm going to use this to select the material. So here I select this plane and an MI underscore grass is going to pop up. I can select the grid right next to it and you'll see that the materials of the entire project are in here. Now say there is a JPEG or PNG that I like to use for my grass texture. I could select a new material by hitting this plus button, hitting the button right above and renaming it. So I'll name this grass. And then I can go over to the right hand side. I could pick a color for it. I could go into more and select the texture. There's several different elements that I can change here, many different properties that we have. But I'm going to also know that that takes a little bit of time. Perhaps I just want to bring in a material from Twin Motion Library. I can do so by going up to the library on the left hand side. And then I'm going to go to ground, nature. And I'm going to drag and drop this grass onto the plane. It is tiling a bit, so I'm going to increase the scale of it. Perhaps I want to make it a little bit darker as well. Hit OK. And one additional thing that I can do to bring in a little bit of realism is use a Quixel Mega Scan asset for the next material I apply. So let's take a look at what that looks like. I'm going to go to the library once again, and I'm going to go down to the Quixel Mega Scans. Now, if you're not familiar with Quixel Mega Scans, it is a real world scan library of surfaces and 3D assets. So it's going to be a great resource for anyone wanting to enhance realism within their scene. So I'm going to go to surfaces and perhaps we want to put asphalt into this project. I can do so by going to rough or fine, whatever you would like to do. You'll notice that when I hover over the download button, it's turning white. If it does not turn white for you, it means that you're not signed in to Epic Games. So we can always change this by going to File, going to the bottom of the page, and you'll see that I'm signed in as Sam Anderson. You can use your Epic Games account that you use for your launcher to sign in here as well, and you'll have access to all of the mega scans here. So I'm going to go back to this course asshole, and I'm going to download it. I'll take a moment to download. Now, once you download it once, you won't have to download again, so you'll be able to import it freely. I'll drag and drop it, and it's going to have that object creation. Now, once again, you won't have to do this every time. We'll take a look at the 3D asset to understand what that looks like. Now the material's been brought in. Perhaps I want to make it a little bit darker. I could select the material, make it a little bit darker, bump up the scale a bit. And now let's take a look at some of the other Quixel assets we've got. So I'm going to go into the 3D assets portion of the library. And I'm going to go to street. Let's take a look at the props. Perhaps I want to add in some bike stands. So I already have this downloaded. I can drag and drop it into the scene. And here we go. If I hit F on my keyboard, it's going to direct the viewport to that object. And now what I want to do is I want to create an array for this bike stand. So I want several of these bike stands here. I can hold down shift and I'm going to hover over the X axis here, this line on my orbit. And I am going to drag and drop the asset down the ways a bit. When I let go, a copy window is going to pop up. Now this is going to allow me to create an instance. So if I change the material of the bike stand for the first one, it's going to change the material for all of them. I can create however many I want here. And this spacing is going to be determined by the amount that you moved the bike stand. I'll go ahead and hit OK here. And you'll see that they all popped up. Now, say I want to provide a little bit of organization here on the scene graph. On the right hand side, I can click on that bike stand, right click, select new container. I'll name it bike stands. 
and I can drag and drop each of these into that folder. And I'm going to move this above and then once again, drag that last one into the bike stand. So this can help you organize your file a little bit. Now let's take a look at some of the other things inside the library. Now we've got characters that we could bring in. I'll go ahead and select a group. Perhaps we bring in this group of kids here. So I'm gonna drag and drop them into the grass. You'll notice that it popped in as a group here, so it already is a little bit organized. I could move them all as one group, or I could also individually select them. So I'll hit the drop down button, and perhaps I select Kayla here. She's playing with blocks, but I want her to be dancing. I can go down to the bottom of the page, and you'll see that she's playing at the moment. If I click on that text, I can then select dancing. I could also change her cloth color. Perhaps we want a different blue since the others have blue. So this is the smart objects we're referring to in Twinmotion. This is going to allow you to create mini animations and the lively people within your scene without having to individually import rigged characters. So I can now take a look at some of the other characters we have. We have posed humans as well as cutouts. So I encourage you to play around with these and see which best fits your aesthetic. I'm also going to bring in an animal. Perhaps we bring in some butterflies. So if I drag and drop them in, you'll see them flying around. I can also take a look at some of the other elements that are quite lively in our library. Underneath objects, I'll go into particles. I could drag and drop some fog in, perhaps it's in the morning. I can bring in a water jet. This one I just think is fun. I'm probably not gonna keep those two in there, but wanted to show you they exist. I'm gonna go back to my library and take a look at decals. If I'm building out an environment and I want to add some decals or stickers to the objects, I can come into this portion of the library and then drag and drop these decals into the scene. You can change the size of this and the opacities. So you really have control over a lot of these elements. So now let's take a look at some of the tools that Twinmotion has. You'll see that we have sections as well as notes and measure. So if you are an architect who's looking to improve their workflows or communication efforts, these can be very helpful for you. We also have animators, which I won't be going into depth into today, but if you have objects within your scene that you would like to have rotate or move as a part of your animation, you could apply these to your objects. I'm gonna go back here and go to Reflection Pro. This is going to give you a higher fidelity reflection in your scene. So to showcase this, I'm gonna go back to objects going to create a primitive. So here we have these kind of simple shapes that you can create. So I'm going to drag and drop this box here. Perhaps this is a sculpture. I can use the middle panel here to scale it up. I'm going to apply a chrome material to it. What the reflection probe is going to do is it's going to calculate a 360 image from the center of the reflection probe and puts the entire 360 image into the reflection of the objects affected by the ratio of the probe. So it's going to allow you to control what you're looking at in these reflections. So I can change the size of this and you'll see how it's manipulating the reflection in the chrome sculpture. I'm gonna go ahead and delete these. I don't think I want these in my scene, but I did want to bring them to your awareness. And now let's take a look at how we can build out our environment. I'm going to showcase the bottom of the screen UI here. So first, this button, this will be for any file management that you would like to do, such as preferences, which we'll refer to layer, as well as saving and merging files. I'm now gonna go into the import options. So here, you can bring in multiple FBXs. So if there is an asset that wasn't in our library that you would like to add, uh, perhaps a particular type of character, you could find them in any online or perhaps build you know, a sculpture yourself and bring it into the file through the import system. We also have the ability to bring in data files as well as import direct links. 
So these are going to be a plugin that allows you to make edits in your source model and see direct changes in your Twinmotion file. So this is going to be great for improving your workflow if you are in the architecture industry, but you could also update any model changes in the FBX file as well. So if I were to go back to the source model, make some changes to the context, I could go in, refresh the model, and it's going to retain the materials that I applied. So this can be very helpful of a way of not breaking that system and that workflow. It's going to improve interoperability, which is something we're really working towards. Now let's go down to the second option here on the left-hand side. This is your context. This allows me to create some paths here. So if I select this button here, you'll see that we have characters that we can bring in, vehicles, bikes, or if you have something that's already custom animated, you can bring that in as a custom path. I'll choose character path here. I'm gonna select this pen. I'm gonna draw a spline here. I'm gonna hit the right button on the mouse to stop that. You'll notice that it starts to populate the spline with people. I can change the width of this spline here and I can change the attire of the people as well. Now I can always go back and edit the nodes well. So if this is a little bit too much of a curve here, I could go in and edit that. So you can always go back and change it and it's gonna update as you do. So now I'm gonna go back to the context and start painting in some vegetation. When I click this button, the trees pop up on the left-hand side. I'm gonna drag and drop these into the bottom of the screen here. And I'm gonna hit the paint brush. And I'm gonna start painting in the trees into the scene. It's like I got one on the sidewalk, I can hit the erase button. I can change the size of the diameter of the paintbrush. And I can start deleting the ones that I don't want here. Now let's take a look at some of the other contexts we have, such as the vegetation scatter. I'm going to drag the long grass into the bottom of the screen. I'm going to select that grass and hit the plus sign. And then I'm going to click on the plane and start to fill it up with the grass that I'd like. So this looks pretty good. I'm gonna go back to the context and I'm gonna take a look at urban. So this is going to allow me to bring in geometry from the open street map. I'll go to the magnifying glass at the bottom. I'm going to type in New York because that's where I'm at now. I'll select New York here. It looks like it's dropping me in Brooklyn. I can select this rectangle here, zoom out. Perhaps I wanna focus on downtown Brooklyn. I could select this area and then hit grab on the right hand side. And this is going to bring in a white massing model of context. So since I already have buildings in my project, I don't need to do this, but it could be an option for you. I'll go back to my contacts and see that we have everything from here pretty utilized. I'll then go into setting. I can further develop the location here by selecting that button and hitting the magnifying glass. I'll type in New York once again. Now this is going to be controlling the lighting. I want this to be a sunset shot, maybe a golden hour type of image. I'm gonna set this to August. And then I'm gonna change the north offset, meaning I can choose where that sun location is. So I'm gonna put it on the left-hand side so I can get some good shadows and contrast in my viewport. And then I can always go and change the background. So if I come up on the top of my project, you'll see that we have a backplate here that has a city on it. I can select the city and switch between countryside, mountains, city island. I think I am gonna keep it with city. And then you could rotate it as well. So I'll go back down into my little park I'm creating here. And I'm gonna go into the settings again and take a look at the weather. So this will be very important for the competition as I know that this is something that's crucial to the element of design. I'm going to move the slider and you'll see how the weather starts to change over time. So here we're getting some precipitation into the project and then going back to the sunshine. If I go back to the precipitation and then switch up the seasons, you'll see that the trees start to transition to fall and that the snowfall starts soon thereafter. 
you'll notice that the trees switch to winter and then go back again. I'm gonna have it be closer to the summertime. I'm gonna go into effects on the right-hand side. I like playing around with this smog setting. So this is going to be that hazy environmental aspect that you might or might not want to incorporate into your design, but it's gonna kind of soften the image a bit and provide some distance in between this initial park I have and the background. I'm gonna go back into settings here and take a look at lighting. Here, I can control the exposure. I could control the white balance, so perhaps we want it to be a little bit warmer here. I can turn off and on the GI, so this is the global illumination. You'll also have some ability to change the properties for a bunch of different settings, such as the sun intensity, ambient, so this is going to allow you to brighten up some of the shadows that you might have in your project. I'll keep it as is for now. And I'm now gonna go into the camera settings. So here we can change the field of view. We can also change depth of field. So if I turn this on, you'll see everything gets a little bit blurry, but I can hit more here, select the target, and then select the object that I want to be in focus. I could do this manually by changing the distance with the slider and editing the aperture as I'd like. Now I'm gonna go back to camera and I'm gonna play with this parallelism. So if I turn this on, this can be very helpful for architects who are wanting to make sure that the verticals in their image stay aligned and straight. Now this could be helpful for elevations. However, I think for my image today, I want there to be some converging lines, so I'm gonna turn that to off but I am gonna increase the vignetting here. So that's going to be the black edges around the viewport. It's gonna focus in the middle a little bit for the image. And then I'm gonna to go to this visual effects. So here under color gradient, I have a lot of different options under type. I could select fall here. I can then go in and edit contrast. If I want the contrast of the shadows to be greater, I could say, oh, this is a little saturated. I might turn it down. So you do have options for creating the aesthetic and mood that you'd like by using these settings. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to none here. And I am going to go back to the visual effects. Now there's additional filters here. So you could switch this over to sci-fi if you'd like. There's also the hidden line, which I like to use, especially in architecture. You can see that it doesn't work well with my characters, but I could always turn them off for this portion. And so this can be helpful, especially if you are trying to convey an idea in architecture without having all of the information of the materials in. So you are able to do it as a sketch or create a visual identity that works for you. I'm gonna go ahead and go back though. So I'm gonna to go to the camera, visual effects. I'm gonna go back to none here. And then you also have the ability to do clay render. So as I mentioned, that white clay modeling context that comes in, you also have the ability to change all of the geometry in your project to clay. You could select which objects have the clay applied. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. Go back to the settings. So you'll see that we've walked through each of these here. And I'm now going to show you how you can create media for these. So today I'm gonna to focus on image and video. However, there is 360 panoramas, phasing and presenter, which are great tools for improving workflows and communicating your ideas to others. So the phasing tool is great for design options. It is also great for construction timelines. You can get very creative with how you are showing your scene through phasing. We also have presenter in the cloud, which are going to allow you to present all of your images and videos in one place. And the cloud is going to allow you to send a link to your client, your partner, your colleague. I encourage you to look that up if it's something that could be useful for you. I'm gonna go back to media and select image here. When I click plus, it's going to capture my viewport. So this is going to become my camera. I can hit the dots here and rename this. I'll rename it to trees. And I can go in and hit more here and it's going to allow me to change any of the settings that I had set up previously. Now, there's also a format option here. 
So I could select that format and change the size if needed. So here I could select 2K, 4K. For this competition, the image will need to be landscaped and at least 3000 pixels wide. You can select custom here and change the ratio as needed. Now I'm gonna go back into the image here and if I want to change the camera, I can move this about, perhaps I want this to be zoomed out a little bit more, and I can hit refresh on the thumbnail here. And you'll see that the thumbnail is updated. You'll notice that a person is walking in front of the screen. We might not want that. I'll zoom back in and hit refresh here. And now let's take a look at how we can create an animation from this. I'm gonna go back to the media tab. I'm gonna hit video. I'll hit this plus button once again, and you'll see that it comes up with the first frame. I'm going to zoom in for this one and hit the plus button again. And when I play it, you'll notice that it automatically creates that camera path. If this is too long, this is 10 seconds and I want it to be shorter, I can change the time of it here. So I'll put five seconds for that. And this is gonna be part one of the animation. I can add in another part by selecting the plus button here. For this one, I don't wanna move the camera, but instead change the sun direction. I can add another frame by selecting plus. And you'll notice that when I hover over each, there's a more button popping up, as well as a settings button. So the settings down at the bottom is going to change the settings for the entire part. However, if you click the more button of this thumbnail, it's going to change just that one thumbnail. So I'm gonna select location, and I'm gonna change this to a later time in the day. When I go back to the video, you'll notice that the thumbnail is automatically updated. So I'm going to change this to five seconds and we're gonna play this all the way through. So if you are creating animations with the paths, you'll see that it's a seamless transition between the two, but you could also create multiple videos if you'd like by going back to the video and creating a new video. Now let's take a look at exporting these. I'm gonna go down to the bottom button and I'm going to hit MD for image. I'm gonna select the trees image. I'll also go to empty for a video. I'm gonna select both of these videos and then I can hit start export. Select the location and start exporting. Now this is great because it allows us to do batch renders. So if you have multiple images that you're testing out, as well as animations, you can export them at the same time. The exporting time is going to differ from computer to computer as well as project to project. It will range from time to time, but you'll see that for two animations and a high resolution image, it's rendering quite quickly, estimating at one minute, 14 seconds here, I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out of this so we aren't all waiting on this export together. But I do want to take a look at some other elements and tips and tricks for working in Twin Motion. So I'm going to quit the media mode here. So it's gonna take me back to my original mode setting. And I am going to take a look at the sky. So perhaps we want to better convey the sunset in this image. What I can do is I can bring in a sky dome into the model. Now I'm going to send a link in the chat that's going to direct you to a tips and trick video that goes into depth about this. The nice thing about the video is it has a link to download a sphere that you can use as the sky dome. So I'm gonna go into the import button on the left-hand side, I'm going to import the sky dome that I have as an FBX here. I'm gonna hit okay. And as I mentioned, it's going to be a sphere with an image on it. And I'm gonna walk through the process of making it a translucent material to better reflect the lighted sky. When I hit the material picker, you'll notice the material has the image already applied. What I can do is I can go to the grid down here at the bottom, and I'm gonna to need to bring in a translucent material. To do that, I'm gonna go up to the library, go to materials, go down to translucent, go to white styrofoam, drop it into the model. And then I'm gonna go back to the sky dome on the bottom, go to color, more, 
I'm going to click this texture and hit copy. And then I'm going to go to the styrofoam, do the same process under color, more, texture, and paste. Now the texture has been applied. I can select the dome and I can rotate it so that the sun is better aligned with my sun in twin motion, which is coming from this left hand side. And then I could always go in and darken the sky if needed and edit the material as I'd like. So I can select the white styrofoam color. I might darken it a little bit. You can make it a little bit more blue if you'd like. Now you can replace this with any HDRI that you'd like. The video that I've sent goes into a little bit more detail into customizing that there. Now, one thing I do want to note is when I'm applying these materials, I'm applying them to all materials that had that HDR sky applied. So to describe that a little bit more, let's take a look at this button here. This here says replace material. And then I also have apply to object. Say I have a model in here where I've applied metal to a lot of different objects. If I have replaced material here and I update the material with chrome material, it will replace the material entirely. I could also change this to apply to objects. So perhaps there's just one railing that needs that chrome or stainless steel metal. You can then apply it to object as needed. Now for an additional tip, let's take a look at the optimization of our scene. So here I can take a look at my statistics so this is going to be my scene graph. You'll see that this is at 40 frames per second. And you'll notice that if I go and take a look at the grass that I have, so this is going to be that scatter vegetation. When I turn it off, the frame per second is going to increase, which means I'm going to be able to manipulate the scene a little quicker and it's gonna have higher performance. But I wanna bring that back in and be able to have this not affected as much. One thing that Twinmotion does is allow you to control the optimization of your viewport without affecting those final renders. So to do this, I can go to the menu button here, go to preferences, and under grass fading, you'll see that I have it set as far. I could change this to near, hit OK, and it's going to raise this FPS up a little bit. And you'll notice that now I can see it fade out a little bit in my viewport which is totally fine. In the final rendering, it's going to have that entire grass included. Now we can also take a look at other landscapes. So to showcase this, I'm gonna look at this kind of blank area we have here, and I'm gonna go into landscapes. I'm gonna drag and drop this flat landscape into the scene. A window will pop up, letting you know that it's preparing the terrain. So you'll see that it's been brought in. What I can do is I can sculpt the terrain here. You'll notice that a circle pops up on my screen and I can start to control the landscape here. If I hit Control Z, I can undo that move. You can also change the shape of your circle if you want to be a little bit more organic with the way that it is building out that landscape. So this completes my tips and tricks. I know that this was a very quick introduction into Twinmotion, but I hope it gives you the right tools that you need to create and visualize your world that you have designed. I know we are very excited to see what you produce. There's a lot of creativity out there and this is all very important. So we wish you the best of luck in your Twinmotion journey and we hope that you can stay on. We'll have a Q&A right after this. So please stick around and ask any questions. Thank you so much for that, Sam. Um, uh, quite a few questions have already come in and I've seen that Belinda's been active in the chat, uh, answering a lot of people's questions already. That's great. And before we jump into the, um, to the, to the Q&A, um, Sam showed some quite cool stuff that you could do with the sky. And in fact, we had a few people asking about that as well. Um, I'm just gonna put a couple of links in the chat for people actually. Um, so, uh, there's actually a, a video tutorial so if anyone wants to um, know a bit more about that and um, go through the steps for um, those sky dome uh, things then you can have a look at that video tutorial and we've also got the um, the fbx file that sam used in the demo there i'll just send a link to that as well 
So I've just, uh, yeah, if you were interested in that, take a look at that YouTube link, um, download the file from there, um, and you can um, have some fun with that. Um, great, okay. So I've got one question here from uh, Van uh, Vandeth. Van Vandeth, are you there? Do you want to raise your hand and I can um, unmute you? Hello, nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us. What's your question, Van? Um, my question is about um, when I use the replace object, when I import from the sketch app, so I, I use the replace object in the twin motion and then I, it's, it's a pay, it, it's the same, like, such as I replace the tree and then the tree is a pay, the is same exactly every object. So my question is that any option that we can use the replace uh, replacement object link to to rotate or to uh, change the size of the tree, such as it's just a one tree. Yeah, that is a great question. And that also tells me that you have experience with twin motion. I love that you're using the replace objects. For anyone who has not heard of this tool, if you select objects in your spring graph and right click, you'll have the ability to replace those objects. So what Van is describing is say you have a bunch of trees that you've already put in manually and you wanna switch those trees to a different type of tree, you could select those, right click on your scene graph, put replace objects, and then there's going to pop up with a new interface that's gonna allow you to drop and drag the trees that you want into the scene, and then it's going to perform that action. So unfortunately, there's two things. You do want to make sure that that transform button is on. Um, however, like if you try it with cars and such, it's going to not be as accurate. So it is going to keep that translation. So if you have a car in a parking lot, we don't want it to rotate 15 degrees. So it is a little bit complicated in that way, but you just want to make sure that you have that translate on in that scene. But that's a great question. I encourage anyone who um, wants to kind of explore that tool to, to check it out. Great, thank you for that, Van. Um, we've got a few anonymous questions, well, a few shy people. Um, so um, one anonymous question, uh, and yeah, this is a common one. I'm just asking about what computer specs you've got there, Sam. Um, uh, yeah, what, what, uh, what, what do you need to use Twinmotion? What kind of rig do you need? Yeah, so I do indeed have a little bit um, of a high performing computer. It's a 2080 Super for my GPU. However, you do not have to have that um, quality of a card. So the minimum requirements is going to be that you have six gig uh, GPU and then the kind of higher quality recommendation would be for eight gigs. It's also gonna be dependent on your RAM. So the minimum is going to be 16 gigabyte RAM um, with a high quality at 64 gigabyte RAM. So if this is all confusing to you, I would first go check out your specs on your computer. And if you go to the Twin Motion support site, there is going to be a benchmarking um, article where you can take a look at your specs and understand what you need for Twin Motion to run well. It does run on Windows. It's recommended Windows 10 and higher and also Mac 10.14.6 and higher. Um, I know that there, we're testing with the M1 chip right now if you have Apple. So I would do some additional research if you do have that. Uh, but yeah, that's all to say you don't have to have a, a ray tracing card in order to use Twinmotion right now. So um, don't let that scare you with the 2080 Super card that I have. Um, it will have the minimum requirements on there, on, on the website for you to, to take a look at. Cool, great. Cheers, Sam. Um, another anonymous question. Um, have you got any tips uh, or tricks for camera move camera movement? Um, this this uh, attendee is having a bit of trouble creating a, a smooth uh, turn. Understandable. So on the top right hand corner of your twin motion user interface, there's going to be a eyeball. That's where I click to show the navigation. You can go there and I, I believe the third button down is going to be speed. There you'll be able to transition between bicycle, walking, flying, 
um, or vehicle, and that's going to control the speed that your camera is moving at. So if you're having a hard time with that, you could move it to the walking speed so that you can make more seamless transitions between the camera when you're setting up those images. Um, however, the being able to control the camera path is something that's not quite possible yet in twin motion. However, that is something that you can do in Unreal. So I know we've got a few questions about, you know, what if you want to bring this into Unreal? We do have a plugin where you are able to import your twin motion file into Unreal. There you'll have access to editing the camera path as needed. And I saw that there is also a question about animated features. So if you have an animated feature that's already kind of built into twin motion, such as the animals, they're going to have a skeletal mesh applied. So when you bring that into Unreal, the skeletal mesh will be imported and you can reassign that skeletal mesh into Unreal. But Unreal is going to be where, you'll, where you will be able to bring in those custom animations. Great, thank you, Sam. Okay, we'll, we'll try uh, Vanitha Naka then. Vanitha Naka, can we change the material of one of the objects? If multiple objects have the same uh, material, uh, which is uh, been, been imported from SketchUp? Yeah, that's another great question because that is going to require some forethought when you are bringing in the model into Twin Motion. So if you do have multiple materials throughout your SketchUp scene and you're bringing it in, you need to be careful how you bring that in. So that's referring to the keep hierarchy or collapse on materials that I referenced earlier, like the very, very beginning of the tutorial. So if you have those multiple materials or I'm sorry, multiple geometry with that same material, but you're gonna wanna edit them in twin motion, I would go ahead and keep hierarchy because it's going to be easier to change that. So once it all comes into twin motion, it is going to be a block. So that can be great if you are wanting to kind of speed up your workflow in twin motion, but it might require you to do a little bit of work in, in SketchUp beforehand to make sure that your layers and materials are a little bit more in sync before you import them with the keep hierarchy. Great. Thank you, Sam. Um, we've got a couple of questions left, but they actually seem to be more about the design competition uh, rather than twin motion. Um, uh, Bilal Khan, um, you've got a question about, about the competition. Bilal, if you'd like to ask your question directly, raise your hand now. Otherwise, I can uh, answer it for you. There you are. All right, Bilal, are you with us? Hey, hey, Benedict. Can you hear me? Hi, we can hear you, yes. What's your question? Okay, cool. Great. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks for the great session. Uh, yeah, so the question uh, basically is uh, with regards to the competition. And uh, uh, are we going to be discussing something regarding uh, that uh, as to, you know, what is expected of the entries? You know, are, are we expected to submit, uh, you know, videos or just images or, you know, just anything that, you know, uh, we, uh, we deem fit? So, sure. uh, you know, that kind of uh, stuff. So I'm probably best best place to answer that one. Um, so first of all, pretty much all the information or hopefully exactly all the information you need is uh, on the Design website. So if you go to design.com forward slash redesign the world, uh, all one word, um, you should be able to find all the information there. Uh, the page in particular you need is, is, is the brief and rules. Um, there's the prominent link, uh, it should be pretty easy to find. Um, uh, participants will need to submit uh, three things mainly, um, a text description explaining the concept of the idea, uh, and then using twin motion to um, export uh, uh, an animation file, so one video file, uh, and also one still image um, of, of your concept. So, so, so that's it. Um, in terms of what we're looking for, um, it's quite an open brief. We want uh, to see creative ideas. Um, we want to see what people come up with. Um, the, the main um, judges will mainly be judging it on the, the idea, the concept of, of the idea. But obviously kind of technical proficiency is something that will be uh, taken into account as well. Uh, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Cool. Great. Um, any more questions? Um, okay, we've got a few, a few other questions about the, um, the competition. Maybe I can quickly run through those. 
Anike has asked if we get a, a certificate for uh, entering the competition. Uh, we don't have any certificates. Uh, the top 15 entries, though, will be published on the zine. So uh, throughout November, we'll be publishing um, the, the, the 15 best uh, entries as judged by the, uh, the judges. Um, and there's um, those 15 will get um, a small like 500 pound prize money and then the the bigger prizes are for the top three so the judges will also be from that 15 selecting a first place second place uh, and third place so um, no certificate but you will get published on design uh, and there's a, a bit of prize money as well uh, and uh, Tisha has asked uh, how long uh, the uh, length of the animation? I can see Sam is typing an answer now. I don't know if you want to go ahead and answer that, Sam. Um, oh, sorry, I was answering the one below, but uh, for the length of the for the competition entry, it's going to be thirty seconds, and there are also some uh, file size or I guess animation size requirements as well. Then, do you know the the max size for the video? Uh, off the top of my head, I think it is 300 meg, um, but um, I would um, advise everyone to check the brief. So go to design.com forward slash redesign the world. Um, all the details are there, including um, specs. I should also say that if you do have any other questions about the competition or the entry, there is a, again, on that, on that page, there is an email address that you can use to, to contact the, the team that's looking after the competition. Uh, it's redesign the world, all one word, at dezine.com. Uh, so um, if you do have any other questions that, that come up while you're thinking about your entry, um, then you can email us there and someone will get back to you um, as quickly as they can. Um, great, that's all the questions in the Q&A. Um, we are yeah, just kind of just running over time. So um, Belinda and Sam, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope the session was useful for everyone watching at home. All that's left for me then, I think, is to um, encourage everyone to enter the competition. Um, as I said, all the information is at design.com forward slash redesign the world. Um, it's open to, for entries until the 15th of September. Um, so um, make sure you get your entries uh, in by then. Um, thanks again, Belinda. Thanks, Sam. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks to everyone else for, for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.